Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Cynthia Holt, and I'm the Executive Director for the Council of Atlantic Academic Libraries. Um, I want to welcome you today to our Introduction to Pressbooks webinar uh, with our presenter, Alexandra Mercaccio, who is our Atlantic OER lead. Um, so uh, before I uh, get started, I just want a couple of housekeeping uh, things. Uh, if possible, keep yourself muted and uh, your video off unless you're speaking. And please feel free to, to turn on your video and uh, unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Uh, Alexander will be taking questions throughout the session. Um, so if you have a question, ask it at the time. Don't wait till the end, uh, although we will also take questions at the end. Um, at this time, I wanted to acknowledge that CALL CBPA represents member libraries uh, across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. Uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, we acknowledge that the lands on which campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups. And we acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, in Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wulistuiak, uh, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. Uh, we at Call CBPA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Um, and uh, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, introduce Alexandra. Uh, she has been working with CALL since I think August uh, as our Atlantic OER lead. Uh, but before that, she was at, the, uh, at Brock University as their OER librarian. We're very excited and happy to have you with us now, Alexandra, and looking forward to what you're going to share with us today. I pass it over to you. Thanks, Cynthia. Okay, we'll get started. Gonna get the screen sharing set up. So welcome everyone to this introductory press book session. So as Cynthia said, I'm Alexandra. Um, I was the OER librarian at the University of Guelph before making my way here to call. And now I am the Atlantic OER lead. So just to give you a sense of what we're gonna be covering today, we're going to be kind of going through a brief overview of Pressbooks. So this session is very introductory. I've designed it in a way where you don't have to have any prior knowledge of Pressbooks. So we're going to start from scratch, talking just about what Pressbooks is, the software itself. We'll look through the elements of Pressbooks. So what is book information? If you've ever been in the software itself, you've probably seen the words parts and chapters floating around. So we're going to talk about that distinguished difference between those different elements and how you use the basic features. <coughs> Or then I'm going to kind of get into some of the more technical features um, that are very common to be including in a press book. So media, so any kind of images, videos you want to embed, but also interactive elements. So this is something called H5P. We're also going to talk about accessibility. Of course, we because Pressbooks is a web book, we really want those press books adhering to WCAG 2.1 standards, which is the current web accessibility guideline standards. So we're going to be talking about some of the basics of how to do that and just getting ready to publish your press book. And then hopefully, if I have enough time, we're also going to be going into Pressbooks. I've logged into my account already, and I'll be able to kind of show you what some of this looks like. There's plenty of visual aids throughout this presentation, but I figure a live demo is probably also really valuable to those of you who are more visual and interactive with your learning. So to start with a quick overview of Pressbooks. So what is Pressbooks? This um, thing we're talking about today, it's an open book publishing software that's Canadian based. And really the focus is on accessibility, interoperability, which by that we mean this is something where you can work on common or like on content in a Word doc and then bring it in. It's able to like be exported as an EPUB, a PDF, and also interactivity. So unlike a traditional textbook that you would get that's print, where you might have some guiding questions at the end or that really be it of a chapter, you can embed more interactivity, get your students or any of your learners really kind of interacting and working with the book and the content a bit more than you could from a traditional print book, which does kind of give it a unique twist compared to your more traditional textbook. So 
There are a lot of different use cases for press books. One of the most common ways we see this open book publishing being used is create an open textbook. Anything that is published on press books is completely free for users to read as long as it's been published. So because OER is supposed to be openly licensed and openly and freely available, this is a very common way to do that for textbooks in particular because they're text heavy. Um, another thing that's very common is to adapt an existing OER that's already a press book. So let's just say you find a press book that was made on introductory business and it was made in the States. That business textbook could be really close to what you need for your first year business course, but maybe a lot of the examples are American context and that's not going to really work in a Canadian based course. So maybe you take those examples, you modify them, you add different examples, maybe you add some content about Indigenous um, businesses, just to kind of really take that base content, take some of those base concepts, but really change them and adapt them to make them work for your setting. And there's a way to kind of bring in that original press book so that you don't have to retype everything from scratch. There's also um, a use case for incorporating interactivity into your learning materials. So if you have some text heavy learning materials, but you want reflective quizzes or other things like that kind of to break up the bits of content, that's a really good opportunity to be using press books. Um, there's also a chance to publish student created materials. So if anyone has heard the term open pedagogy, this is often student driven work where students are creating the learning materials. And so if you wanna find a platform for students to publish this work on, Pressbooks could be an option, again, especially if it's text heavy. And this is just kind of scratching the surface, but in general, the one common theme through all these use cases is the fact that they're all very text heavy with maybe some media or interactive components. So to give examples of ones that already exist, here are actually three that have been published on the Atlantic OER Pressbooks Network, and they kind of show different use cases. So the first one, the um, Bumblebees of Unamaki, that one was actually a student created material that um, was part of a course assignment. And so it goes through the history of bumblebees in this particular area, and it is um, now like being used as like a learning resource. I believe Parks Canada actually links to it now. And so because it's text heavy, it's not a traditional like textbook in a classroom, but it's one example of getting a student involved with creating learning materials and then having something that others can learn from at the end. In the middle, it's the academic integrity module from Mount St. Vincent. This is something that I believe was developed in the library and it kind of goes through the basics of academic integrity. So again, not necessarily that traditional textbook that we might think of for open or for open learning, but it is a valuable learning resource to a lot of students. And it means that we're removing that cost barrier that could come with traditional materials. And then finally, introductory to psychology and neuroscience bun edition. This is a first year psychology textbook that was created by folks over at Memorial University. So this is that kind of first example I talked about in the use cases, that classic textbook that could be replacing a very expensive course material. So to kind of give an overview of our Atlantic OER Pressbooks Network, so these accounts, so you create an account before you create a book, they are open to anyone who's at a Cal member institution. So as long as you're a member of one of our 15 institutions, you're going to be able to request an account. It is managed by myself, who's the Atlantic OER lead, and it's supported by the OER facilitators at the different member institutions across call. And right now, now, I wrote this a couple of days ago, so we don't know if maybe some of them have changed, but we have about 26 books published so far and plenty more in the works. So this is a really great resource for a lot of folks. And those 26 books are having a very large impact across our network. So the final bit of housekeeping that we'll get into before really getting into this um, nitty gritty is just about requesting an account. So if you're thinking about setting up an account and you wanna work with Pressbooks, you'll go to the Pressbooks site or for Atlantic OER where you can request an account or you can email the email that's in this slide to request an account. Um, one thing that we do ask is just email from your institutional email so I can confirm that you are affiliated with a call member institution. Um, and then your account will be created and we'll add you to something we like to call the sandbox book, which is just a book where we assign you a little chapter where you can kind of play around with some of the different features and test things out. Um, book requests are done separately from this and 
you have to let us know. So a lot of folks do these work collaboratively. If you recall the previous slide that a psychology textbook, that wasn't a single individual that was working on it. It was several folks. So we just need to know so we can get them set up with accounts and added. And I see Cynthia, you've turned on your screen. So I'm guessing there's a question. Uh, yes, but it's probably something you're going to answer as you go through. Uh, there was a, a question about what kind of usage stats you're able to see for the book. Um, that will be covered kind of later, later on, but um, I can answer it briefly right now. Um, so please correct me if I'm wrong, Cynthia, but right now, um, some of the usage stats we can see, first of all, um, let me double check actually. So a lot of the things that have to do with usage, I don't think that any of the users can see. It's something that we can see kind of at the back end as administrators. Um, if they can see their own for their own textbook. Right. OK, so if, you can see this for your own textbook. I wasn't necessarily going to cover this in a ton of detail, so I can answer with a follow up email later on just because there's a lot of content to cover here. Um, so if you just send if you can let me know who it is, I can add some details later on. But we do. Well, I can send the answer out to everybody uh, who yeah. registered. So OK, thank you. Um. And so, yeah, a network administrator will be able to create your book, set up your URL, and you'll be good to go. Um, and so to kind of briefly answer this, um, the question, there is like a plugin that we have that allows us to see usage stats. Um, and there are some limits, but also some good things about it. So we'll answer that after. It's just out of the scope of what I'm able to talk about today. So finally, cloning books, this is done if you are interested in adapting a press book. So that was one of the use cases I mentioned. If you found a textbook you really like, but you want to modify in that some way, um, that's where you might consider cloning. And this is what you do. So if you are doing an adaptation, you have to let us know when you request a book, give the title of the URL of the book you're looking to clone, and we can hopefully be able to do that for you. So getting set up. So once you've logged in, you've got your account, um, you'll be able to have access to your sandbox chapter and any books you've requested. And this can all be found in the My Books tab, and we'll look at what the Pressbooks login looks like in, la later on. But essentially, your screen will have a red ribbon across the top that's kind of like the, one of the main toolbars. And in the upper left corner, there will be a drop down that says My Books, where you can click between your sandbox chapter and any books you're creating. And the books will always be automatically set to private for you. What this does is it means that folks will not be able to see it published, if you will. It won't be public. People won't be able to see your work in progress, and you'll be able to kind of make it public once you're ready. And from here, you'll be able to create and adapt material. And so this is what a book dashboard will look like if you click a specific book. So this is a test book I made just to kind of be able to show you every feature. So you can see we've got the dashboard that's on the left side. Um, and you can see home, my catalog, analytics, um, which is where you'll find some of the usage data. You have organized, which we'll get into, book info, which you'll get into, um, the export and import buttons, the publish, which is where you'll be able to make a book public, the plugins, which is where you can find H5P that we'll talk about later, media, and we'll talk again about media in a bit, and then the users, which is where we're able to add users if you're collaborating with folks. Um, et cetera. So this is what the main page of an individual book will look like. So let's get into some of those features. So we'll start with book information. So what do we mean when we say book information? This is, as librarians will know, the book's metadata. So all of the kind of information or data about a book. So this is going to include things like the title, the author, and you can see the book info here on the right. So we've just clicked down a few more in that left toolbar. We've gone from the dashboard page to the book info page. And this is just the beginning of it. You'll scroll through for quite a while to see it all. But you can see that I've set the title to be test book in this one. I've decided I don't want a short title, so I've left that blank. I don't need a subtitle, so I've left that blank. And I've got myself listed as the author, and I can add more authors. Say, if Cynthia wanted to collaborate with me on this, I could add her as one of the authors here. So. There's a few key ones that you'll want to set for sure. So the title, what's your book's title, who the authors are, the URL, which we'll be setting for you once the book is created, um, then any copyright and open licensing information, and then a description of the book. So if you recall a few slides back, when we looked at those three different books, 
it had the title, it had the author, and then you could see there was a little blurb underneath each one. That's the description. And that's just kind of, think of it as like what you find on the back cover of a novel where you have a couple sentences about what the book is about. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to be long. It can just be something as simple as introductory textbook to psychology for first year undergraduate students. Um, so when it comes to copyright, Though these books are free to read, you still need to set some sort of copyright license. So something that is true about the software with Pressbooks is if you do not complete this part of the book information, Pressbooks is going to default to traditional copyright. So you have to fill it in in some way if you would like your work to be an OER, if you would like it to be openly licensed. Now, typically here at Atlantic OER, our default license is CC BY NC, and I'll talk about what that means in a second. Um, but obviously we can see use cases for other um, licenses being selected. So for example, if you're working with traditional indigenous knowledge that has certain proto cultural protocols around it, we're not going to sit here and force you to use the CC by NC license. So there's plenty of use cases where we can understand why you might choose alternatives. But to understand what we mean by CC by NC, it's a form of open licensing from Creative Commons. And so Creative Commons is a way of kind of giving folks preemptive permission to do certain things that traditional copyright wouldn't necessarily allow for. And so the different license elements, the four here, kind of allow you to kind of show what those permissions are ahead of time. So we have by, that is the symbol in the bottom left corner, the little person, it almost looks like a little washroom logo. That means attribution. And that's the first part of our license that we kind of default to. And what that means is that if someone wants to use or share your work in any way, they have to give you credit as the author. So if someone decided that they wanted to use my textbook test book in a classroom, then they would have to acknowledge that I was the author. Next, we have non-commercial. That is the upper right corner, the little dollar sign with a slash through it. What it means is that you say you find my test book and you're interested in sharing it. You can share it with other folks. Um, however, you are not to be able to make um, profit off of it. Again, that is the other key component of the license that we um, default to here with Atlantic OER. Um, then we have share like, that's the one in the bottom right, the little kind of like circle looking thing with an arrow. What that means is let's just say you were doing an adaptation and you wanted to, you found this really great book that you wanted to adapt. So let's just say you wanted to adapt my test book and I had the share like, that means that your adaptation has to have what we consider a compatible license. So you must also openly license it. You cannot adapt my book and then put it to traditional copyright because that's considered incompatible with the license I've picked. And then finally, we have no derivatives, which is the equal sign in the circle. And what this means is that you're free to share it. You're free to read it, share it with others. However, you cannot adapt it in any way. And this is really important to note if you were, say, looking at a book that you're considering adapting for your course, especially because there are certain adaptation cases that we don't think of as adaptation. The most common being that translating a work into another language is considered adaptation. So let's just say you are teaching a course that is taught in French and you find a great English resource that you want to translate. If it has this symbol, then you would have to reach out and ask for permission. You are not able to just translate it without preemptive, like without asking for that permission. So is that so to kind of recap here? They all combine together to create different licenses. I will not go through all of these, but I will highlight two, and that is the CC BY. So that means you can kind of share, at, adapt, do kind of anything you want with it as long as you're giving the original creator credit. So if someone wanted to come along and adapt my test book to use in their class but have other examples in it, they could do it as long as they acknowledge that the original was my work. And then the CC by NC because that's the default here at Cal. So that means that folks can share my work, they can adapt my work, but they always have to give me credit and they cannot make commercial profit off of this. So the next bit is organizing the book. So that was, for some reason, the kind of bit that comes above in that toolbar, the book info thing that's in the left toolbar. So this is what the main page of Organize looks like. So Organize is where you start actually creating content in your book. You've completed your metadata, you've got your license set, 
now you actually want to create the content that's going into your book. And you can see it's broken down into kind of three sections in this screenshot. We have the front matter, the main body, which is considered a part with little chapters underneath it, and then the back matter. So to cover what all that terminology means, front matter is any of the components that are found at the beginning of the book. So think of things you would find before the actual, so if we're thinking of a novel, think of all the things that you would find before the actual novel begins. So you might find a table of contents. You might find a foreword from the author or an epigraph. These are the components that are found in front matter. Then we have the back matter, and this is things that are found at the end of a book. So again, if we're thinking of a novel, these are things that come once the actual story is over. So you can think of glossaries, maybe citations for the whole book if this is like a research textbook. Those are the kinds of things you'll find. And then we have parts and chapters. So the parts are the main sections of a book that make up that main body. And so parts um, really like think of them as the organizational structure that you're maybe breaking down your content into. So let's just say, for example, you were doing an introductory chemistry book for first year and you needed to cover two topics. You needed to cover quantum chemistry and you needed to cover organic chemistry. You might have part one, quantum chemistry, and then the chapters that are associated with it, and then part two, organic chemistry and the chapters associated with that. You can kind of use the first chapter in the beginning of a part to kind of introduce what the forthcoming chapters will be, but essentially parts are organizing components. And then finally, there's chapters, and this is the actual individual components of content. So again, if we use that organic chemistry, quantum chemistry um, chapter, maybe your first chapter in quantum chemistry is what is quantum chemistry and what does that mean? And then you would actually have content that explains and answers that question. And so these chapters are organized within parts and often are, again, thematically organized by how the parts look. So let's kind of break them down one by one and go into a bit more detail. So we have first front matter. So this is where you can actually add the more introductory and organizational elements. And so what you'll do, um, if we flipped back a few slides, you would see that on that organized page, there was a button beside front matter that said add new front matter. You'll click that to add a new piece. And each piece of front matter is going to kind of look like its own chapter. But the one kind of difference is, and you can see it here in the screenshot, there was a button that said that will prompt you to select the type of front matter, and you can pick from this huge list. Now, this um, screenshot I have doesn't show the full list, but you can kind of get a sense of what's there. We've got lists of tables. We've got um, a dedication, all kinds of things. Um, so you want to click one of these just to kind of make sure that Pressbooks knows how it needs to be formatted. Then you have back matter. It's very similar to front matter. A screenshot of it would look almost identical to the front matter one, except it would say back matter instead of front matter one. Um, and so this is like those concluding and organizational content pieces that come at the end of the book. So just like with front matter, you click the add back matter button on the main organized page to add a new element and each will be like its own unique chapter. And you'll make want to make sure that you set the type of back matter that you wish to add. Some have similar layouts and purposes. So if you find that you see terms within like the selection for front matter types or back matter types that seem similar, just pick the one that you feel best represents. I know that some of them sound overlapping, but don't worry or don't think too much about this. And then finally, there's parts and chapters. So again, parts for organizing the content. Chapters are the actual content itself. And similar to front matter and back matter, there is a add button for each of these things. So add part to add a new part. But make sure you watch when you're adding a new chapter that you add the chapter into the part you want your chapter to end up in. So again, if we go to that example of the chemistry textbook, if you wanted to add a chapter to the organic chemistry section, you do not want to be clicking add chapter from the quantum chemistry section because that's going to put the chapter in that part. And so here we can actually kind of see what I mean. So see how here, this is just in the test book, we have the part called main body. And here it says add chapter and add part. If I clicked that add chapter button, it would add a third chapter into this main body section. But if I said add part and clicked that button instead, it would add a new part below the main body. 
Now, the one great thing is, let's just say that you've realized that your chapters are in a strange order. So let's just say I wanted to put this test chapter first and chapter one was actually not my first chapter. And I realized this after the fact, you can organize and change the order. So when I highlight my mouse over chess chapters, you can see in the screenshot, there's an option here that says edit. So that's to go in and edit trash to delete it. So if you were to say add a chapter to the wrong part, you can delete it. Um, view is to actually kind of preview it. And then finally move up. So if I wanted test chapter to come before chapter one for some reason, I can move the order. So this is again, really great if you realize that you kind of got the content in the wrong order or you added something to the wrong section. But just keep in mind that chapters can be rearranged when they are a part of the same part. So let's just say I actually wanted test chapter to be in a part that came after this main body. I can't move it there. Best you can do is create a new chapter in that other part, copy paste the content over and just delete this version. Um, so again, you do all of this by using that move up and move down function. And then finally, we get into editing content. So again, if we were to just go back a slide, you can see when I highlighted test chapters, one of the things that popped up was edit. And this is how you actually get in to work on the content itself. So Pressbooks runs on what we call a what you see is what you get interface. If you've ever worked with WordPress, it's that same kind of idea. Um, and it runs on kind of actually a very similar software. So many of the features you're going to need to add style to your paragraphs or your content is found in the toolbar at the top of the text box. So if we're looking here, the very top we see it says chapter one. That's what I've titled my chapter. It's got the permalink, which is just the hyperlink or the URL that shows up when you're in the chapter. Then you have your add media button. And then you have a whole set of tools. And this is going to look pretty similar to what it would look like in Microsoft Word. So you have your style. So that's your paragraphs, your heading one, heading two, your bold, your italics, et cetera. And if you're ever not sure what one of these symbols means, you can hover your mouse over it and just leave it for a second. And then a little descriptor will come up. And then in this area here where it says, this is the first chapter in the main body of the text, that is where you actually add the content. And you can change this. You can erase this chap. Um, it. And if anyone's curious, because I know you can probably see there is a little like you're in this main tab. That's the visual, which is this interface. It says text HTML beside that visual word. All that is, is let's just say you're comfortable writing an HTML. That's the HTML or um, coding view of what your chapter looks like. So if that's how you would prefer to work, you can do it that way. But for most of us, I think we would stick to this because it just looks very similar to a Word document. Um, Another final thing to note is that unlike Microsoft Office of today, Pressbooks does not have autosave. So you need to be actively saving um, fairly regularly. I always say, personally, I recommend after every paragraph, every couple paragraphs, I would hit save. If you've added media, I would hit save just in case. Um, and you can find it in the right side toolbar here. So you can see we've got the part little box that says part and it tells you what part it's in. We have the status and visibility, and at the bottom of that status and visibility box, there is a red button that says save. That is where you'll be able to save content. So just make sure that you click it kind of often just because of the lack of autosave. And then finally, what's really great is even though it's that what you see is what you get interface, it really doesn't tell you what it will truly look like once it's in the web version, but there is a way to preview what the web version of your content will look like. And this is really good if you have any specific formatting that you want to kind of come forward, say you want your images centered um, on the page or something like that. So there is a button you can click and I will just go back a slide again. In that status and visibility box, we saw at the bottom, there was the red button that said save, but at the top, there is a gray button that's outlined in red. Yes, the color contrast on this isn't great, and I apologize for that. Um, this is just kind of the color scheme of Freshbooks, but that preview button there, what it'll do is it'll open this chapter up in the web version so you can see what other folks would see if your chapter was published. And it's a good way to just check over your work and make sure that it's looking the way you want it to look. Then we have adding links. So there are a couple options. One of them is like if you wanted to say embed images and videos, or there's just hyperlinks. So to hyperlink, it's very similar to how you do it in Word. You highlight in text, 
you click the right click button. That is what that symbol means. That's my shorthand for it. Um, and then you can add it in and you use descriptive language when you're doing it. So in general, I recommend don't just write um, something like and additional information can be found here and then have here be the hyperlink. What you want to do instead is say additional information, say it can be found at the H5P website and have that highlighted and hyperlinked to the H5P website so that folks know precisely where they're going. It's a point of accessibility and we'll get more into that in a minute. And then finally, there's adding media. Now, adding media is a little bit unique in Pressbooks. So there is that button and that says add media that we saw at the top of the page and you'll follow the prompts to upload media. So you'll hit the add media button. It'll prompt you to upload the file. Um, and then in the bottom right corner, there'll be a box for alt text for any images you're adding. Um, I strongly recommend please add alt text to all of your images and we'll talk about how to do that. And then what happens is, is that once you've added media, it becomes part of what's called your media library. So let's just say you wanted a diagram of, I don't know, H2O added to multiple chapters. You just have to upload it once. It becomes part of your media library, and then you can just add it into any chapters that you need that in. Again, if we're looking at a chemistry textbook. Um, so you'll upload it, it becomes part of your library, and then you'll be able to add it in. And then finally, there's adding H5P. So H5P are any of those interactive elements. So if you've ever looked at Pressbooks and seen drag and drop games or interactive quizzes, this is done with H5P. So you'll start by going into the plugins and activating H5P. So if you noticed on my textbook, test book, that home screen, when I was going through that left toolbar, I said the word plugin, but I never said H5P because it has to be activated first. So you'll go into plugins, you'll activate H5P, and once it's activated, then it shows up as one of the options in the left toolbar. So what you'll do in H5P works very similarly to media in that you have an H5P library of content you're creating. So you'll go into that H5P toolbar, you'll create something new, you'll follow the prompts to create the new H5P element, and what you'll be able to do is with these newly created elements, you'll be saving them and naming them, and again, it gets added to a personal library. So if I wanted a quiz on the components of H2O, and I just said, like, wanted the quiz question to be, what are the components of water? And I had, like, H2O, H2O2, and different options as um, my little quiz. What I might do is just kind of say components of water. I'll save it maybe as components of water. And then in the chapter where I want that to go, I can then go hit the add H5P element button, which shows up beside the add media button once your plugin is set up and you'll pick it from your personal library and embed it into your chapter. And then finally, I won't go through this in too much detail because I know not it doesn't apply to everyone, um, but one thing to note is that Pressbooks is not actually compatible with LaTeX, which is a very common mathematical note, um, notation, um, and instead you have to be using MathJax. So the way that you do this is you go in the plugins, you have to turn off quickly tech, which at the time that I wrote this is um, currently kind of an automatically turned on plugin, but we need it to be turned off. And then to use MathJax, you're using this syntax. Um, so it's the square brackets around the word LaTeX. And then I just have star equation. That's where you write your equation in LaTeX. And then you have to put the like square bracket backslash LaTeX square bracket. Um, and this is just how Pressbooks recognizes that it's looking at LaTeX in order to get it to render properly. This is another place where I strongly recommend once you've added it, use the preview button because there still can be issues I've found at least with, and I know Cynthia's run into issues with Pressbooks, not 100% recognizing LaTeX formatting. So you just want to kind of be checking it to see if any of the syntax is doing something kind of strange with the formatting. Sometimes it won't format correctly. You can always reach out for help because these things just happen. And then the last bit I'll cover quickly before we kind of go into Pressbooks is accessibility. So our expectation with Atlantic OER is that users are making their Pressbooks as accessible as possible. And my recommendation is that you're following MCAG 2.1 guidelines since those are the current web content accessibility guidelines. Um, so I'm going to do a very brief overview of things, but I'll also be leaving folks with a resource that I wrote while I was at the University of Guelph that'll help you make Pressbooks more accessible. So some things to keep in mind are font. So both in terms of font size, 
So recommendation for anything that's web-based is that you don't go smaller than 12 point font and also the font itself. So that is determined by the book theme. We'll make sure things are set to sans serif fonts like the one that's being used in these slides because those are typically more accessible um, fonts. We also want to think about content organization. So making sure your content is broken down in a logical way that there's no super long paragraphs that content is kind of chunked appropriately. Making sure you mark decorative images. So let's just say you've added in an image of a flower for some flourish, but it actually doesn't really have to do with the content. You mark it as decorative so that a screen reader will kind of skip over it. And any image that is there for a purpose that you're using alt text, which I'll show you how to do in a second. Making sure you have transcripts for any audio components. Making sure, again, that your descriptive, your hyperlink names are descriptive. So again, instead of using the word here, making sure you're saying something like the H5P website. Making sure you have good color contrast. And in the resource I'll give to folks at the end, there is a color contrast checker you can use. So a good example, very classic, is just making sure that you have a white background with black text. That's going to pass color contrast standards. So that's kind of what I would default to. Um, so these are just some of the elements. Um, but let's talk about how to write alt text, because I think most of us know that we need alt text, which is just an image description that's done in a couple sentences to describe images so that screen readers can use it to describe any images to folks using screen readers. So the kind of trick to writing alt text is that you don't want to describe every last detail in the image. So what you kind of want to ask yourself when doing this is, why am I showing this image? What is the purpose of it? And then you'll use the alt text to describe the features of the image that are part of that key takeaway. So you won't describe the whole thing. So I'm going to use an example from the call website. This is the current call website. And I might have two reasons for showing this. One, I might want to highlight to folks what our mission and vision is. But just as similarly, instead, a different way I could be using this image is to show kind of the different things that you can link to from the about page. So you can see there's a left toolbar that's got about call, member institutions, board of directors. So depending what I'm doing, I might just focus my alt text on describing that one component. So if I was doing this or showing this image for the purpose of showing this kind of left navigation bar, what I might say is something like, this is a screenshot of the um, about page of, from the call CVPA website. On the left side, there is a beige colored box that you can find hyperlinks to other parts of the website, such as about call CBUA, member institutions, board of directors, and executive committees and strategic plans. Comparison, in comparison, if I were doing this to show the mission and vision section of this page, again, I might start very similarly with the main about page from the call CBPA website. On the right side of the uh, website, which takes up most of the screen, there is a set of content that starts with the mission statement and the vision statement for a call. So see how in both examples, I wasn't describing everything on the page. We're just describing those key components that are the reason you're showing this image. So getting ready to publish, we have a publication checklist for a call, which we will give you when you set up your account. And you just want to make sure that you're reviewing this checklist and it's going to have things like testing all your links, making sure your book is accessible, setting a license in the copyright section um, and other components. And so you just want to make sure you're reviewing your book before you publish it. Um, and that checklist is a great way to think about the different things that you might review. And so to make a book pr um, public, as I mentioned at the beginning, these books are automatically set to private. In the organized page at the very top, which isn't in any of the screenshots I showed, it, there is a section where it says this book is currently set private. And then it's like a little, almost like two options on like a multiple choice quiz between private and public. So you can do that. You'll set your publication date and the book information. There is a publish section that you'll go through and then you'll make it all public. So this is just like a couple of resources and I'll make sure that you all have access to the slides so you can look at the hyperlinks for these resources kind of moving forward. So some resources for making Pressbooks. There's the Pressbooks user guide, which is what was made by the vendor itself. We have a Pressbooks accessibility guide, which I wrote while I was at the University of Guelph, and it'll go through all those components of accessibility I mentioned with step-by-step -step directions for how to do those things in Pressbooks. We just don't have the time today in an introductory session to really get into the details of it, so I'll leave you with that resource. And the publishing checklist is currently a PDF, so 
if you were to request an account, you could get it that way. And then just two other links to leave you with. Um, if you want to learn a bit more about the open licenses, you have further questions. I know I can go into a lot of detail today. We have a link to the Creative Commons licenses page that gives you more further details on those different licenses. And then finally, the H5P website can be a really great resource if you're thinking about adding H5P elements, but you're not really sure if that element exists or what it would look like. The H5P website has a list of all of their elements and you can kind of look at them and see a description of what each one does. And you can use that as a way to like get a tour of some options before you actually pick something and create it in Pressbooks. So now we're going to flip over. This is the current test book that I've worked been working on. My setup in Pressbooks is going to look a little bit different from yours purely because I am a network admin, which means that I'm able to support folks and see other books beyond just the ones I'm working on. So the Administrator Network, you won't see that, but you'll have the My Books up here at the top and you can see I've been added to the test book, which is that sandbox that we, I was telling you about where you'll get a chapter and then my test book that I'm working on. This is the home page. If we were to go into the book info, which is on that left here, you can see I've set the title, a short title, the authors. There's a whole bunch of other things like translators, if you needed them, reviewers, if you needed that, um, contributors. So if you have folks that maybe weren't full authors but contributed to the press book in some way, say as editing or uploading content that you wanted to give credit to, you could do that here. You can set the publication date. Um, and then you keep scrolling. And this box is important to fill out is the copyright. So here you can see we've got all rights reserved, which is the default if you don't select anything. So because mine is currently blank, that's what it will default to right now. But if I wanted to say go with that CC by NC, I would do that here and hit save. And I'll just take a second and you could see I get a confirmation that says I've updated the book information. Now let's go into organize. And let's just say I wanted to add a new part. Hey, Alexandra. Yeah. Just in, uh, in case you, I, I'm not sure if you're going to mention it later, uh, but one of the things in the book info is uh, before you could choose an author to add to your book, you actually have to create them first. Oh, yeah. In that, um, I've run into that problem in the past where I thought they would be just listed because they were admins, but they aren't. No, you actually still you have, have to, to add them. <laughs> yeah, you have to manually add them. So if you have collaborators, like I mentioned, you have to let us know so we can add them to the book. But then you also have to add them as authors and just make sure and check that everyone's listed correctly. Um, that's something that I believe is in the publication checklist that we've added because of that strangeness. Um, and here you can see I can add a new part. So let's just call this the new part. <laughs> and you can see if I wanted to, I can add content and say, this introduces the second part of this book. Let's just say I wanted to make that my intro. Um, and let's just say that I wanted to include something that says, so, Let's just say at the top here, I wanted a little heading here. So I hit heading one and I say, what is this part? And as you can see, I visually see that I've changed a heading one here. And underneath is the actual content. Um, and let's just say I was, so now I can save it. Because again, we want to save. And now it's all set up. And if I were to go back to, you can either flip through here, you can see I can flip to the next piece, which is the back matter. I can go back to the previous chapter, or if I just want to see everything as a whole, I can go to organize. Let's just say I want to look at chapter one. You could see again that edit, the trash, the view, the move down shows up. Let's just say I wanted to edit chapter one. And if I wanted to add an image, I can do that here. So you can see, you can either select files, 
And you can see up here, we've got a media library, which would just have anything I've already uploaded. I haven't uploaded any images to my Pressbooks account, so that's why it's blank right now. There's also an option to insert things from a URL, um, which I don't have a URL right now, so I'm not going to do that. But I can select files, go into my files. You will quickly learn that I have a bit of disorganization here. Oh, no, this is going to take a minute. OK, so let's just say I wanted to take an image that's a screenshot from my personal library. That's my signature. Let's just say I want to put my signature in. I could do that. And I might add alt text that says the author's signature. And then I could then go to the bottom, check everything, and then hit insert into chapter. I'm not going to do that, but that shows you how the add media works. And then finally, we'll go to the plugins. And you can see what's active, what's not. And that H5P is currently not activated. So I'll click activate. Now it's good to go. And you can see it's popped up in my toolbar here. And I have H5P content here. And you can look at your library. You can add something new. And that's how it all works. So we can add one really quickly. Um, oh, right. I would have to set this up. Um, you just have to consent to opening it. All that does is make sure that you have the connection um, into all the different kinds. And I can then, once you're adding a new type, you'll hit get, install, it takes a minute. And then from there, you'll be able to actually start working with it. We won't go through the whole thing because creating a multiple choice question does take quite a bit of time and we want to leave time for questions. So I will leave the demo here. But you can see it's successfully installed. And then you're able to start making things. So I'm going to stop sharing for now. But if folks have questions, I'm happy to go back into Pressbooks, go back in there and show you anything that you want to see in more details. I'm just conscious of the fact that we want to leave some time for questions here at the end. Open the chat now. And people can feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question directly. And I'm sorry that I haven't been looking at the chat. I just can't see it when I'm in presenting. Oh, no, mode, I've been so going to. OK, good. In the chat. Thank you. Um, And uh, just an FYI, there is a, a on our webinar site. Uh, there is a, a webinar on an introduction to H HTP. Uh, excuse me, uh, H five P. I don't know why I'm saying HTP. I've heard it lately a lot. Um, anyways, and I just put the link into the chat. Um, it was May thirtieth, an introduction to H five P in Pressbooks. Lynn uh, McGregor did one. So if you want to get more information around doing H5P, you can watch that webinar, uh, or you can just ask questions. Uh, somebody did ask me about the facilitator uh, information to find out who's the facilitator. We do have a list. We're just updating it, uh, but as soon as that's ready, it will be it will be made available to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and for those who don't have facilitators, Atlantic OER, so that would be Alexandra um, <laughs> and myself as backup, would uh, do direct support for those users. And if you request an account and your institution has a facilitator, I always like introduce you at that point so that you can have mm -hmm. a contact that way. Yes. So if Cynthia was your facilitator, say at, at MUN or something, I would then go like, OK, your account's set up. I've CC'd Cynthia Holt here, who is your facilitator. And that way you have that contact info. You have that contact. And then Cynthia knows that you've been added, um, that you have an account. And that allows us to kind of have communication that way. Yeah, and for adapting books, uh, they don't have to be currently press books to adapt. 
Uh, mm -hmm. They could come from other types of platforms like OpenStax and things. Yep. Uh, we do have a process for, let's say, bringing in OpenStax books uh, into Pressbooks. It's a little bit more complicated than a direct import from Pressbooks, mm -hmm. um, but we it, it is possible and we do have a process for that. Uh, there's also, you can bring it in from Word files, all sorts of things. Um, so yeah. if in doubt, you can always either ask your Just facilitator ask. or Alexandra at the OER address and we can yeah. walk you through that. And that's like why Pressbooks kind of really stresses interoperability. Um, like I know some folks don't like the fact that they cannot autosave um, in Pressbooks. And so I've seen folks like create their content in Word documents and then just upload it after the fact and import it that way. Um, so if you're not super comfortable um, using it for the main content writing, that's an option to you. You just have to watch it again, really use the preview to make sure that any images or figures you've embedded upload correctly because there can be some issues with that. Um, so just keep that in mind, but it can be a really great way at least to do like the text content if that's if you're more comfortable working in a Word document. And uh, just as a, an FYI right now, we have a little bit of a book limit, but as of April 1, we will not have, we will have unlimited um, uh, being able to create unlimited numbers of materials. Uh, so that will go live in April 1. And what will happen when we move to the unlimited is we will also have LTI integration with the learning management system, like your Blackboard, your Moodle, uh, does your D2L or whatever. Um, they will be directly, you won't have grade passbook, but you will have be able to uh, have a direct connection to Pressbooks for your book without having to put what we call an iframe around it or a box. Uh, this is important for you, especially if uh, your user communities or you yourself are have a book that you're trying, you have uh, content uh, that you may not want to share as broadly. Uh, and that would some examples of that might be uh, you're looking at content indigenous materials that have a cultural protocol around them. Uh, they can still be set to private but then shared directly in the LMS through the LTI integration with the students or whoever's in the course um, and without them having to, be, without us having to create individual Pressbooks accounts for them on Pressbooks. Um, so that's an excellent uh, upgrade that's going to happen in April uh, to allow the sharing of private content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very excited about the LMS. It's also really great, and I've seen instructors do this in the past at University of Guelph, where they've created an open textbook, but they just want to pilot it in their class for, say, a semester before they really make it public to the broader audience. That could be an opportunity to do it as well. Um, so for folks, if you're like a little nervous about making your press book public because you want to kind of do that test run, um, that is a really great way to do it. So I definitely recommend taking advantage of the LTI integration once we have it. <laughs> Yeah, and we'll be letting everybody know who is yeah. registered on the platform uh, when the LTI integration becomes available. Uh, it's also uh, great uh, to use Pressbooks uh, for uh, uh, class, having the class develop the book or um, also doing hackathons or uh, or sprints where you get a bunch of people together in a weekend and and create the book. Uh, all together in in one fell swoop instead of uh, over a longer period. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, that we call those sprints. Uh, we also will be bringing back the Atlantic OER development grants um, in the spring. Uh, so just a heads up that that will be coming. Um, we just uh, we weren't able to do it this. Uh, uh, we weren't potentially going to be able to do it, but we actually are able, we have identified funding to be able to do that uh, in the next year. So for those of you who've had uh, faculty members or yourself wondering about the uh, the grants, they will be coming back mm -hmm. and they'll be open to anybody at a call member institution creating a learning material at, uh, for a course. Okay. Yes, uh, so by spring, uh, so it's it's a matter of logistics. Uh, in terms of the date when they, uh, uh, sorry, Anne had asked in the in the um, chat whether spring meant after April 1st. Uh, that's when the money will actually be available to us, but potentially they can be awarded uh, in advance of that because I know some folks are hiring out of Young Canada Works grants and things like that and need to know sooner. 
Uh, so we will announce sooner, but award the inf the, the funding uh, by April 1. Jasmine says, sounds like an exciting announcement coming up. <laughs> Good try, Jasmine. Good try. <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> All I will say is stay tuned. Um, yeah, and if folks are curious to like see what kind of things can be done with student love and initiatives, I've been a part of those projects where students create the textbooks. Um, so you can definitely ask me questions about what that can look like. Um, in my case, we were getting students to co-author a textbook on Black Canadian history. So um, within the course, there were quite a few discussions around what it means to kind of be a student engaging in public scholarship, what it meant to engage in that topic specifically. Um, and we did a lot of work kind of making sure that students knew their rights when it came to the fact that they would have the copyright and like the authors of this material. Um, and it turned out really great. And we had three um, three different groups within that class consent to publish. And now there's a book out there that talks about Emancipation Day celebrations in Canada um, that is completely student authored. And it's really great to see it. Does any questions that anybody has? Anything, just ask anything. If you mm -hmm. uh, if we can't answer it, we'll find the answer for you. Well, uh, thank you, Alexandra. Uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, and the uh, recording and the slides will both be up on the website this afternoon, uh, very likely. I'll send out an email to everybody uh, when they are up uh, so that you can, um, uh, if you want to, share it with others or go watch it at your leisure. But all of those will be up this afternoon for, uh, for you to use. And we hope to have uh, more coming in the future. So just stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone.